Hi, good afternoon everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm David Bloom. That's me on the uh, left of the screen there. I'm a co-founder of the SDU Group. I've been a CFO in fast growth SMEs for nearly 20 years now. Worked in lots of different situations. I'm joined today by Chris Spitz. That's him on the right. Hi everybody. Chris is an accountant who specializes in financial modeling. Formerly with Baker Tilly, Chris builds models for our clients, both large and small. Uh, he's also been a modeling consultant for the Royal Mail for the um, last three years. Okay, so welcome to this masterclass. It's the second in our series. Uh, SDU Group conducted some market research back in early October, which some of you may have seen in the press. We questioned 250 SME senior managers, not, not just finance uh, professionals. The headline finding was about 61% of SMEs don't forecast. So we thought this webinar would be a good idea, which certainly seems to have been validated, judging by the number of people we have on the, the call today. Uh, we've got a lot of valuable know-how and tips to get through, but before we get cracking, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. If you're on a laptop or a smallish screen, um, on the top right you should see an orange arrow or somewhere on your screen. You can click that and it will um, collapse the GoToWebinar uh, menu. Also, we're not going to be able to take questions verbally, but we will take questions uh, if you type them in. On the panel, you should see a chat um, button. If you open that up, please key in the questions. We have James Ashley with us today as well, working in the background dealing with questions. We're going to talk for no more than about 40, 45 minutes, and we'll have questions at the end. We've got a broad spectrum of listeners, so I do hope today there's uh, something for everyone. And uh, to make it a bit more fun, uh, I'm going to put myself in the shoes of an ambitious owner-manager of a business, and Chris is going to be, well, himself. In other words, showing you how an expert modeler supports an organization throughout the life cycle of the company's growth, from startup to exit. Four areas, we're going to cover scoping, delivering the model, supporting the client, and adapting as the business grows. So, without further ado, scene one, scoping. Uh, I'm a potential client. I think I need some help with forecasting. I've got a model in Excel originally put together by my accountant. I've got some Excel knowledge, and I'm confident with basic formulae, so I've changed the model myself over time. But it's pretty basic, and it could do with some updating. It certainly isn't the best use of my time. I want to be focused on building my business. I've asked Finance Gopher to come and talk to me today, and they've sent in Chris, or one of their experts. Hi, Chris. Hi, David. Thanks for coming in. So how, how do we scope this out then? Okay, well, from my perspective, and it might be a little bit obvious to start off with, but really just to understand what it is that the business does, and, and to understand, I mean, from a commercial perspective, not always to start off with from a financial perspective. Reason being, the more I understand your business commercially, so thinking about the um, product life cycle of your business from start to finish, so first transaction through to the end, if I can understand that, then I can understand the financials of day to day because that, that cycle will flesh out all of the material numbers and it will flesh out the timings of those material numbers like seasonality and things like that. So thank you. I've signed up an NDA. I've had a look at the business plan and some other documents you've provided. And right. I've got a good understanding. So can you give me an example of understanding that life cycle? Okay. Okay. Um, good question. Okay. So and um, and for the for the viewers, we're actually um, going between lots of Excel sheets and doing slides, bear with me, it's all real time, so um, bear with me if I click the wrong button at the wrong point. Um, but doing a, so doing a quick tip, okay, business cycle, really important, and this is an example of just a small part of that business cycle. So David, this is the, this is the customer cycle from charging them some income, some revenue, getting the cash in the door and looking at the trade debtors. It's just a small part of the cycle. So assumptions at the top, driving revenue, cash receipts and debtors in the bottom half there. Yeah, okay. and, and someone's built this model, they've built it in a way where, as you say, yellow inputs at the top, um, but they've built it in a way that it's super complicated formally, it's not easy to review, so a quick tip, it's easy just to, if you take out all of the volume and put one transaction in, if you put one transaction in, you can then start to sense check the cash flows that come out of the and, model, and then bear that in mind with the product cycle that you know. Can you show us? So I zero everything, firstly. Um, okay, no income. I've not looked or got into any formally yet, but if I, I can see that this customer three should have started in April to £5 pound 
on 90 days trade terms if I put one unit in, right, I can see it's starting in April for right. five pounds. It's actually though being received in 60 days, so two months time. It's not actually being received in 90 days. That doesn't make sense to me. And without even looking at formally, just using the just using the business cycle. Okay, only a small part of the customer cycle, but that could have been stock purchase, stock build up, release of stock, sale to customer. You could have seen the whole cycle Got it. and the effect one transaction does in the business. Got it. All right. So useful tip in reviewing the world. Okay, great. So I understand sort of that, but um, I know you've got a pretty good understanding of, of, of my business. What do, you, what do you do next in terms of my situation? Okay, so we're still scoping. So understand the business now, and what's next? Really, no, nobody's, everybody's different. So it's just assessing your need. You may be somebody who um, really hasn't got a forecast, has no idea how to prepare a forecast. We can help define, and because we know how your business operates, define how best to forecast your business. It could be that. Right. It could be that you're very much up and running. You've got lots and lots of forecasts, and you just perhaps want your staff trained on some modeling best practice tips. Okay. There's another option there, or perhaps, and I think as you said, David, to start off with, um, you've got an existing model, you're a bit concerned perhaps that it's not great, you yeah. suggested it yourself, there's possibly a bit of a risk in there. That's me, I don't need the training, I, 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 I need that help with my, my model. Okay, it, it's a common fear, and often we get asked to just um, review some models, and I think it's the best way to review a model quickly is just to do a bit of a sense check. At this point, we're still scoping with the client. In a few hours, I can do a sense check of David's model in order to determine whether it's fit for purpose, whether it's calculating correctly his business cycle, or perhaps just with a couple of tweaks and a couple of amendments, we can get it there, or perhaps it's so inherently risky that right. so much that it's not built correctly that we just need to rebuild it. Well, if you sign the NDA, I'm happy to do what you've done so far. I'll, I'll leave my model with you and wait for you to report back. Okay. All right, at this point, Chris goes away and he pops back at some point quite soon okay. and uh, reports. Okay. Hi, Chris. Hi, back again, back again. Um, so, we've done a sense check, spent a couple of hours and got some points to discuss. So, you've audited my model, and that's great. I've uh, not actually audited your model, no. It's just a quick sense check during the scoping stages. Um, auditing a model takes a lot of time because a model audit is actually going through every single formally in a model and signed off that it's correct. Right. That normally takes longer to do than actually building the model in the first place. Okay. So I don't think it adds a great deal of value because I could have just rewritten it. So rather than that, I've spent a couple of hours just to focus on the material areas and to focus on the pitfalls that I know people fall over and just done a bit of a sense check. All right, so this is where I open up the kimono. What have you uh, discovered checking my model? I've dressed the thing. Okay, let's go back now to this example sheet. And what we should do, David, I'll, I'll just get your client model up. And Okay, that's my model. Okay, let's just get rid of the product cycle. Um, so that's your model. Okay, we're not really going to go into the depths of it, but that's how you built your model. And I've got some points to discuss, and I shall pull up the review points. Okay, this is my additional sheet that I've built into your model. Um, it's laid out in a couple of different categories, but to start off from the top, what I've shown is, is this is your projected bank position. Right. Okay. And currently in my model at the end of year one, I recognise that number. Currently in your model, yes. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to show you the variance because I'm going to show you some of the things I've discussed. Right. Some of the things I've discovered, sorry. And having adjusted for those, if you agree with me, yes. show the variance that that has on your year one bank position. Okay, let's go. Let's have a look. All right. So a model sense check. Okay, it, co it covers from a couple of different angles. Assumption to start off with. You would sense check your assumptions. Model calculations. Are you just using the right formula? And did you actually build it well in the first place? Did you adopt one of the best practices? I certainly wouldn't have done the last one, but let's have a look. Okay. So um, assumptions. And there's, there's obviously lots and lots of assumptions in your model, and I've just called out a couple of items here. Okay, but one such uh, assumption is the number of new customers that you're going to win over time. Right. And it looks, this is the numbers from your model, it looks that you've got a step change as at July, so a lot more new customers coming on. That's sort of the sales side that I'm thinking of. Exactly, and that, that's what I think we, um, we can see. My only question would be, just to sit back, second pair of eyes, sense check, Will the sales director really come on and deliver new customers that quickly? Well, he's got a big black book. He tells me he can hit the ground running, but what you, you think is a bit ambitious to see the revenue in July? Well, I guess it is. My challenge would only be 
that doesn't make sense to me. It's obviously your business, it's your assumption, but that doesn't make sense to me. Maybe the chat may take a couple of months just to get going. Let's be prudent about it. Perhaps. Right. Okay. And yeah. Let's employ them a bit earlier. And it's heading towards summer as well, I guess. So, yeah, I, I will do that in a couple of months. Okay, so perhaps if we're moving forward three months to April. Yeah, do that. And if you agree with that, I agree. Amendment, we'll get that into your model. Okay. So not much of a difference, but just one simple assumption change can make a bit of a difference to your year one. That 20k variance is basically his salary for three months. Yeah, basically, and a bit of employer assurance. Okay, I understand. Okay, so um, so we've employed him a little bit earlier. Another question, perhaps, was didn't see a recruitment fee in there for him. I didn't even think about putting a recruitment fee. Actually, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, you may or may not have a recruitment fee, but just. Bit of a challenge there. So if you're happy with that, well, I'm not happy at thirty percent. I think that's way too high. But I could, I've got a, I'd say twenty percent for that figure. Okay, so twenty percent. Let's get in. See what that does. You get a little bit more there. Right. Okay. And as well, about employers and insurance. Just looking at the assumptions that you're that you have with the for taxation. You've got last year's employers in mind. I knew it has gone up, I've just forgotten to change the model. Right. Exactly, and that's it. So we can we're sent checking not only your assumptions but also tax rate and then here's a couple of examples of what we might look at in the sense check. Okay. So so far you found a forty grand hole in my figures. Okay, okay right. An assumption and that's a couple of examples. There are actually a lot more in there that I'd probably like to go through, but to continue for today and um, some of your calculation approaches that you have in the model. Okay. Firstly, so it's not built in line with model in best practice, and there's actually quite, in some of your formulae they're actually quite complicated and wrapped up within some supplier payments. Right. On your supplier payments, on your cash flow, there's lots of overheads being paid. Right. But one of them, overheads too, just the way it, the formula is written, you've actually mapped in the positive within your cash flow. So cash in as opposed to cash out. Cash in as opposed to cash out, easily done in a formula. Human error. But yeah, okay, right. so that's a simple one really and I think that should be accurate in terms of a payable payment should be negative in the bank. I won't argue with that. Right. Okay. And and that's another one then that's in there and one other model calculation basis is the way that you're calculating trade debt. Okay. So the sense check, we're focused on the material numbers, we're giving some of the material numbers and the way that you've modeled this is 60 days trade terms I think is a standard across your customers. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's that's okay if that's if that's how you trade on average. But in your model is the let's take this December's in two months two times that in order to work out what your debt is. It's a bit of a quick way to work out yeah. trade debt is. That makes sense to me though. Okay, but that doesn't make sense if your income really changes on a month by month basis because if you've got any form of growth in there, any form of seasonality in there, for example here in November's income was different in December and what you actually need to do is keep track of, of I think the cash receipts first. Don't look at don't go to trade debtors first. Get to your pool bear with. So get to your um, gross income and, and work out two months later that cash should come in the door then. Okay. Having done that, the trade debtors is then just the remainder basically, the sum of all of the amounts that you've invoiced to your customer less the sum of all of the cash that you've received. Okay. And that will get you to your trade debtors and what that will actually do is I think I know where you're going with this, yeah. Keep track more accurately there. And if you look at our final December twelfth position, that's that's two months worth should be outstanding as December twelfth, which is two point seven million outstanding. There. Okay. So that then to me makes sense, two point seven million, but it's different to your two point five and wow. I think you're overstating cash just because you took that earlier. Okay. So not not sort of forecasting for the seasonality and a change in revenue. Okay, simplifies it, but got our drift thing. What's going to happen when you hit yes? <laughs> okay, and it's exactly that. So wow, your year one bank balance is seven hundred and thirty-eight. I think it was to start off with is is actually a lot lower just because a couple of assumptions and a couple of calculations. Got it. Okay. Well, thanks for telling me the bad news. Okay. Okay. Sorry, to tell you the bad news. Sorry about that, David. But right. it's better to know that than to go for thinking you're going to hit yeah. at the end of year one. Absolutely. Um, and we could get into other recommendations such as modeling best practices. How should you have built your model? I don't want to go there. That's not really for me. But uh, yeah, you it, could do that. It, it, that. Training may not be what you're after today, um, and modeling best practice is, is not something that your model was built on, I'm afraid. So, okay. So let's um, 
I think, having having done that sense check, so we're still at the scoping stages, having done that sense check, come back with a couple of points, having gone through pretty much the whole model, I think I'd recommend at this stage that we should build you something that's a little bit more accurate. It doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to try and rehash your model. Let's build you something that's Okay, more Chris. Accurate. Well, I mean, if I'm honest, you you confirmed to me what I, I thought might be the case. So, yeah, I mean, I've got growth plans that change that into May. What exactly would you deliver? Okay. Um, before I go on to what I would deliver, I'm just going to quickly summarise um, what we did within the scoping section because that really is the end of scoping. Okay. Um, and so, product cycle straight away. Try and understand the business from a commercial perspective, start to finish, because that will then help you appraise financials at a later point. Next, assess what they will assess the client's needs, assess whether or not you're on training or build or and review what you're currently using. Finally, recommend what you should do, and I think in this situation we should build a model. Although that's not always the recommendation, but in this situation I think we should. Okay, that's the end of the scoping session. Apologies if the slides are running a little bit behind what we're saying. We will try and slow down a bit. Um, apologies for that. So we'll go into scene two and pick up where we left off. So you're going to deliver me a standard model, then, Chris. Um, Definitely going to deliver you a model, um, but it's not going to be a standard model. Off-the-shelf products, I think, really just do not work because a business tries and fits in its trading into a standard model, and every single business is different, and so it's impossible to get every business into one standard tool. So we should deliver you something that's bespoke, something that's um, completely applicable to your business. Understand? Okay. How would we deliver a bespoke model to you, though? Um, starting from scratch just does not make sense because a lot of the model, every every model really should have PL cash flow balance sheet. Every model should have that, I think. So there's a lot of a model that is applicable to all companies, but the last stages aren't applicable. It's the last stages that we have to make applicable to the companies, the last stages that we have to tailor. Okay, so so eighty to ninety percent of a model might be standardized, yeah. but if we start off with something that's proven, something that's got no pitfalls in. Yeah. But tailor it to your model, and, and this situation I'd recommend go forecast is something that we're using at the moment that we tailor to each company, and I can give you a demonstration of that. Okay. Yeah, I don't need to see a whole demonstration of uh, go forecast. That is actually uh, available on our website, but it would be good to um, look at what you would do, show me an example of how it's done properly. Okay, and for the benefit of the people listening as well, so not only my pitching to David about the type of model that I'm going to deliver, but there's six things that I think really should be in every model that people are looking for. Six different types of things, and okay, they're all being go forecast, which is what we'll demonstrate now, but um, six things to look out for. Okay. So, let's just give it 10 seconds, Chris, for it to come up on the, the um, screen. It might be a bit behind everybody else. Okay, so I'm just jumping in to go forecast now, and um, what I have open in front of me at the minute is a... Um, is a dashboard, which is a high-level one-page summary, and and what the first thing I think you should look out for in a business is um, the tailoring. The result of having tailored this model to you is that I put specific things in this model that um, are relevant to your business. So all of the different calculation steps to get to turnover, different, okay. different for each business. And um, this version of Go Forecast that I'm demoing is a property services business, so there's property services specific things in here, but Having put those in, the model should always output KPIs from those key business drivers that are what, relevant to this business. What I'm seeing here on this dashboard tab is like a KPI page, the sort of thing I would see in my management pack at the end of the month. Yeah, just some high-level KPIs that are supporting the forecast performance. Right. right. Having got those in, then you can then sensitize those key business drivers. Okay. That's the first thing I think should be in every single model. Very useful. Got it. Okay. Next. Yeah. Second thing that should be in a model um, is an inbuilt validation system. So a model should te the model itself should tell you whether there's a problem, if the balance sheet doesn't balance, or if something doesn't cast, or just all of the checks that you would do manually, put them into the model and let formally do those checks. So so I've got one check here that's, ch that's checking that the PL performance on the dashboard cast to the bottom profit and having deleted that cell, checks have gone wrong within the model. So you've got checking formula within this tool, which I never had in my model. Yeah, on top of on top of the formula calculating performance, there's also lots of formula checking everything. Got it, understand. Okay, in a real version of Go, 
she wouldn't be able to delete that cell just for the purposes of today. So I was found my bar along the top is no longer red, therefore there's the inbuilt validation is okay. is done. Okay, so that's point number two. Point number three um, should be built in line with model invest practices. We've done a whole webinar last time on lots of model invest practices, but one of those uh, the reason why it reduces risk. But one of those um, model invest practices is that we separate all of the inputs, all of your assumptions, David, all of the areas where you're going to change. We separate that from the calculations where I do all of the work. Okay. And then we output in a separate place. So down at the bottom there is a separate tab for the input. Yeah, there's not lots of tabs, but there's it's just that separation is important Got it. in order to result in a set of financial statements. Okay. Okay. And this is now point number four. So what, what should a model output? I think it should output fully integrated set of financial statements, a P and L, a cash flow, and a balance sheet, and there should be no balancing figures in there. there sh it should all balance fully integrated. What, why have you got two cash flows in there, Chris? Uh, just more information makes the model more transparent. I've put two different ways to calculate cash receipts and payment style basis right. and flow of funds basis. So the one that I understand and the other one that my accountant understands. Yeah, yeah. And and as well with two models calculating the same closing cash balance has a bit more comfort. Understand. And my inbuilt validation system is checking that both cash flows are calculating. Okay. So it all adds to the credibility of a sort of forecast. Impressive. Okay, okay. thank you. So that's, that's point number four, make sure your output is fully integrated. Point number five, I think the model has to be easy to understand in order to maintain transparency. The more you understand it, the more likely it is you'll be able to determine if there's a problem in my assumption. That number doesn't make sense to me. Right. Say. Okay, so how do we make it easy to understand? Go forecast. We're just going to jump to our admin staff cost section in order to see what's in that 154K. So quickly navigated to and quickly understood the breakup that's in that number. 154K is those three people. Do those three people make sense? Is now the next question. So, but easy to understand, easy to navigate is point number five for me. And finally, so that took us to our general inputs tab, which contains all of David's um, budget assumptions. But actually, the historic data tab contains your actual performance as you start to trade throughout that first year. And a model should incorporate actual performance so that you can start managing so, those things. So you're saying I can put my actuals in and effectively produce my BVAs, my budget versus actuals, at the end of each month and sort of have most of my management pack coming out of this? Or? Exactly, and we can put in actuals versus budget reports within. Okay, wow. That's all part of the model. Fantastic. Okay, and I think they're the six things that should be in all models. Okay, well, thank, thank you for that. Um, given that, I would like you to... Uh, go ahead and um, presumably you'll find my need and tailor it for me. Okay, glad you're happy, David. Um, yeah, we'll define exactly what you need within your model, and having defined that, agreed that, I'll go away and start working. But as part of that work, I'll deliver a couple of iterations first before we deliver you a final model Got that you then release and use. Okay, let's get cracking. Okay. Right, folks, that is the end of the um, delivering section. Uh, we'll just let the screen catch up with the, the slides. Moving into scene three, reporting. We're going to jump forward six months in time. Uh, Chris built me the model. It's Excel-based, Excel as you'd imagine. It didn't take me much time at all to orientate myself around it, and it certainly is giving me the, the visibility, but also the reassurance that I needed that it wasn't you know, riddled with errors. really is a very, very good tool. My business has grown at this quite tough time. I've hired a couple of staff, um, but I'm sort of bumping up against a couple of operational problems around data and also decision making. Okay, Chris, I know I've driven you mad on occasion uh, with a couple of frantic phone calls, but I really can't thank you enough for being on hand to help me. It really does feel like you're part of the team. Okay, good, great. Um, I was wondering if you could help me in some other areas. Joe in sales. Uh, she's in sales, but finance relies on her each month then for some information. It seems to take her an age to process a few thousand rows of data. She does it each week, but it apparently really becomes a problem around uh, month end. And I'm just wondering if uh, you can work some of your magic. I mean, basically, we need to report by working day three at the latest, but because of this sort of one task, it just always seems to hold, hold stuff up. Can you help? Most definitely. Most definitely we can help. And I think this is service, yet we will help you and support you to become
Um, sales data, David, I imagine you'll recognise this, or I know Joe definitely would. This is your list of three and a half thousand worth of records. Yeah, sales transactions, yeah. Okay, and there seems to be data one field is, is perhaps client name, say, or, or the relevant piece that, yeah. that we're going to search on. Yeah. Because right. It's a simple example for the purpose of demonstration, but I'm sure that we can help Joe out and save us some time. Okay. Um, a combination of a simple use of formally and of some other functionality in Excel means we can do this really quickly. So I'm going to use a COUNTIF function here. So if I count the number of times that the name appears on this list. So doing it from column one. Yeah, so I'm, I'm searching that name and right. as I copy this down, it's going to, Excel itself is going to count the number of times that that appears in the list. Uh, okay. If we get down to here, that's the second time that that's appeared. So really quickly, I can now work out that if I do another D equals count formula at the top and count the number of ones there are on this sheet, right as an entry. Right. Probably human human interaction equals risk. So yeah. no, no doubt, probably making the odd mistake here and there. So having worked out the number of unique lists, use other functionality in Excel, let's now just filter that list and only show a list of all of the ones, all of the unique items. Okay. Having done that, I've got rid of all of the duplicates and I can then just copy that and copy that to a new sheet. Okay, so what was taking hours? Take a second. It really should take a couple of minutes or we can go to the next stage and if she's doing it, okay. now, we can do macros in order to automate that even further, she just clicks a button. And the other challenge I've got right now is just making the right commercial decisions from a financial perspective. Is, is that something you can help with? Again, most definitely. It's part of outside model support, really. It's, it's, it's companies, well, a single element of your business, say, you need to decide upon. Do I go for contract one or do I go for contract two? Do I lease an asset or do I buy an yeah. asset? Do I do just different strategies? It's, it's just making decisions on certain segments. Well, I'll tell you the problem I've got. I've got an important customer who basically wants to move from 30 days to 120 days. I know it's going to impact cash flow. But I'm just wondering what I can do around pricing, for example. Is that something you can help to exactly. burden the pain? We can do that. So we can, we can try and quantify what happened when they paid you on 30 days and quantify what happens when they pay you on 120 days. Right. And based on your cost of money, can we increase their sales price in order to recover some of that okay. investment by allowing them 120 days? Can you demonstrate that? Okay. So and this digital making. Okay, so this is customer A that I believe is the customer that's requesting 120 days. Yeah, that's right. They do 45,000 units on average per annum. Yes. Um, and they're currently paying five pounds ten. Yeah. And they're currently paying on 30 days trade terms. So, on average, they have um, an average debt of balance of around about 23,000 outstanding. Yeah, recognise that. Yeah. Okay, so they're actually after 120 days. So what that means is that their trade debt balance is going to go up to roughly four times the yeah. debt amount. So they're asking for finance from you effectively. They're asking for an additional £70,000 worth of finance from you, yep. which costs you money in order to raise, effectively raise that, that finance by not receiving it in from them. But it's always lending them the money in a way. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to try and, well, it's up to you, obviously it's your business, but um, price per unit, if you could increase the price per unit in order to get some more money out of them ongoing, right. I can show you how much you should increase that price per unit in order to offset the amount that it costs you to give them that additional financing. Okay, so, okay. how do that? Right. Well, it, it's in lots of detailed workings here, it's in some using net present value, using cost of money that we've agreed and we can go through how much does your money cost you and things okay. like that, but based on that, we can do some workings and let the let the model work that out. So five pounds twenty five. If you paid them five pounds if you charged them, sorry, five pounds twenty five, you'd get that little bit more in each month in order to cover the effect of your in effectively increase in interest by funding that okay. amount. So it's not getting a whole seventy K back, but at least it's getting the interest or some some compensation for it. And, okay. it's, and it's helping you to 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 make that decision. What do I charge my customer? How do I 
how do I actually quantify that? We can help quantify decisions, things like that. Okay. The only thing I would say at that point is why are they asking for 120 days? <laughs> and is it because they're struggling? And do you really want to lend them an extra uh, 70,000? It probably is not a bigger problem, but that's for a different topic. Okay, great. Uh, so that's the end of the supporting session. Chris, could you just summarize the key points from uh, supporting? Okay, let's jump back. Um, so, supporting, if we've delivered a model to you, yeah, we're helping you manage your business with actuals versus budget, we can help that process, we can support you using that, mod that, that model. How else can we support you? We can support you to save you time. If you're just spending any time in Excel on a manual process, I'm sure there's better ways to do it. We can help you to make better decisions, and that is actually a really large part of the role as you get larger and you've got lots of project teams with doing lots of decisions Great. in different ways. Thank you. Great. Okay, the final thing, scene four, adapting. So a few years have now passed, and Chris has continued to support the business, iterating the model several times, and helping with data management and support. Chris, it's weird to think the business is now 10 times the size it was when we first met. We've obviously had our ups and downs, but honestly, we haven't really had any cash flow surprises, really in part due to um, the modeling that we put in place. But um, we've reached a bit of an interesting crossroads. We've got an acquisition target we're considering, but at the same time, we've been approached by a bigger overseas player looking right. to buy us with okay. a launch pad into Europe. Okay. Um, I know I'm going to have to instruct advisors at some point, but I just wonder whether you know, modeling services can help quantify these options for me just before I start incurring additional costs. And the answer is yes, David, most definitely we can help with that. Think. When it, when it comes to acquiring something, think when we f were first involved um, with the work that we've done, um, the, the initial scoping was to, to go through and do a quick sense check of the model. No doubt the target that you're going to acquire is prepared a model to show you how much profit they're going to generate over time yep. in order to show you how much value they're worth. Um, we, we can sense check it. We can do that really quickly and do that nice and early before you get too far down the stage and possibly um, Okay. over at financial due diligence stage. Understand. Okay, so we can definitely help with them acquiring, but, but but having acquired, let's say it is successful, having acquired, then no doubt you've got a bit more of a complicated group structure and your business will grow and start to actually, um, it might have multi entities in different Currency. countries, different currencies, intra-group trading, things like that, and we can develop more advanced products and we can Understand. show you more advanced versions of go forecast as well. Okay. Um, the other thing as well, if none of these happen, just like it looks like we're beginning to outgrow Excel um, potentially, and whether you can sort of handle sort of ERP solutions or transform to a different package. I, I can, and and um, we have a client at the moment that is um, actually deploying SAP into their business. They're investing a lot of money to deploy SAP into their business, but they've been using one of our Excel products for quite some time now, so. Actually, growing out of Excel, we can actually help them to um, just put segments of SAP into their business and gradually remove segments from the cash flow forecast okay. so, that, so that they can put in a new system but actually constantly monitor cash so that there's no cash surprises. Oh, okay, I understand. Good to know. But what I didn't touch on, actually, David, was, was selling. Yes. So you said you're at a crossroads. You didn't do selling. And um, we can help you. If we need no forecast, I mean, they're standard industry standard ways to value your business, just multiples and, and so you've already got that side within go forecast. But yeah. if um, if they're giving you lots of deal structures and if you've got multiple offers on the table and things like that, you said it was only one business, but we can help you quantify each of the different options okay. and the earn out mechanisms and things like that. that so the valuation have. functionality that you've already given me in the model, that's sort of a basic high level yeah. uh, this is a more complicated earn out, etc. As you start getting into the real negotiations and we can help value that. Fantastic. And help you compare the different options that you've got, different offers. Okay. All right, and we've touched on data migration, happy to help there. And and that's really it. So Great. Uh, that's the end of the uh, play, if you can call it that. Um, I hope everybody's learned something from that and it's given you uh, food for thought. Um, if you are considering how to go about forecasting, um, I think it would be just useful for Chris just to summarise the key points for today and then we'll move into questions. Okay. Okay. So. The entire life cycle we've talked about today, we've covered it really quite um, briskly because it's it's quite a, it's obviously a big topic. But in each of the different sections, so scoping, we can come in and help understand 
your position, we can help understand your business, understand your position and recommend what you should do. Um, if, we, if we recommend that you should, uh, we should deliver you a model, if it's appropriate, we can deliver you something that's low risk, that's got some good functionality to manage your business. Supporting you thereafter, making sure you're okay using that model and helping you as the months go by, but also anything outside of that model, so saving time, data manipulation and helping you with all important decisions. And finally, adapting, so helping with all those big changes, it can help you to buy, to sell, or, or to maybe progress from Excel. Great. Thank you very much. So guys, um, just a slide coming up now. If you need any help with any of this, our contact details are there at the uh, bottom of the page. You can email, call in, or if you want to go demo Finance Gopher, um, there is a free trial. You can go straight to the tool page or tools page on Go Forecast and uh, download, and we are here to service you. Okay, some questions. Um, Chris will, will share these. Simon Dunn, how long does it typically take to scope? Um, good question. Obviously, different, different businesses. Super complicated business will take a lot longer than, than a very simple startup business. Um, and it's actually quite hard to answer that question because it is so different to different businesses, and we can tell you very quickly, having understood your business a little bit, how long we think things will take. Okay, so if I'm a couple of million turnover, I'm in one geography, and maybe I've got 20 staff, and it's a fairly simple services business, rough idea. If, if, I, if I couldn't review your model in two or three hours, then I'd be surprised. Okay, great. Hope that's helpful. Uh, from Barbara, how much does it cost? How much does it cost? Um, Depends what this is, I suppose. Yeah, save it. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll chime in. Um, if you want to use Finance Gopher, and you don't have the Go Forecast tool, sorry, Basically, for an entry price of £200 a month, there's no upfront cost. What you get is a model that is built to your needs, and you get the support of Chris, modeling experts that we have, and uh, part-time FDs. As long as it's within reason, we're there to help you build the model that you need. Clearly, as you grow and your needs become a bit more specific or a bit more complicated, um, we would have to look at that on a bespoke basis. Clearly, Chris isn't charging a Royal Mail £200 uh, uh, a month, but for the smaller businesses and where, where you can self-support, that's the entry level price. We think that's uh, obviously phenomenal value. Okay. Um, next question from Jasper. Can this work with or integrate into Sage? Um, it's, a, it's a really good question. At the moment, at the moment um, we will take your trial balance out from Sage. So we'll take your trial balance Sage out into Excel and we can then take that Excel into the, the tool. Okay, but um, to start off with, it's a manual process, but we can actually look into actually automating that if you wanted to do yeah. that. Yeah, but just so you're, you're not thinking, my God, I've got a key 80 rows of a trial balance into this, what we can do is export from Sage, for example, and build a very, very simple copy-paste into the tool so it would upload um, automatically. But there's nothing like a good sense check of the numbers at month end anyway. When you're yeah, it, it, I think it's once a month. It's once a month. You finish your management accounts, have them sign them off. Next process, get them into the forecast, and hopefully the management accounts aren't so detailed. It's not too hard to actually just key them into the your forecasting tool. Okay. And this one from Richard. How quickly could you get started on my model? I think I could do with your help. <laughs> no. Give us a call, Richard. Okay. Well, that's it. I hope everybody's uh, learned something today, and uh, enjoy the rest of the rest of your afternoon or evening. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.